So I'm pleased to present on behalf of Team Wildcat, and these were the folks that were on this team. I know you'll recognize a lot of these names, Rodney Andrews, Paul Childs, John Ghent, Edward Lowe, who's a PhD student, uh, Tricia Clement Montgomery, Jason Schlaffer, who's the EOC liaison and really has been my co-pilot through all of this, and George Ward. So um, like Anna mentioned, we had some guiding principles uh, within which our team conducted our activities, but we also developed some additional principles that we consider foundational to any kind of success to occur in, in the fall. So the first is communication. Um, our team was, was very clear that, that we need to set forward what the expectations will be for reinvented campus in the fall. And that needs to be communicated to parents, students, staff, and faculty in advance. We also need to be clear about what our expectations are for behavior for any on-campus scenario. So that would include expectations for physical distancing and for wearing uh, masks or, or face coverings. Um, I'm glad to hear that Anna's team also talked about what we think is critical, which is a shared accountability and a culture that needs to be um, fostered in the fall, um, that we all have this, you know, uh, shared accountability in order to be successful. And then also, like Anna mentioned, this is the number one concern I'm hearing from faculty is that um, we really need childcare and schools to be open in order for us to be successful in the fall. Also have to put my public health two cents in here around a safe health strategy. Uh, a team Wildcat would submit that for any on-campus scenario, all students and student facing staff and faculty must be tested prior to the semester. And second best scenario would be having them tested as they come to campus. We also need to have ongoing testing available and there is public health guidance out there right now as to what that looks like. Um, an alternative may be serology testing, and I know Dean DePaula is, uh, has a team that's working to that end. Um, we would need to have rapid deployment of contact tracing, and that might be a team of folks at UK that are deployed when infections occur, or that could happen in collaboration with local and state health department. We'll also have to monitor surge capacity at UK healthcare and other local hospitals. We would submit that the university should provide masks, soap, disinfecting supplies to students and throughout campus. Uh, we don't think that we can expect students to provide these on their own. We'll obviously need to have a quarantine residence hall or other space reserved, and then ongoing monitoring and surveillance will also be important. We would suggest that across all of the four scenarios, we should be thinking now about reinventing student services. Um, we should consider deploying a readiness to return survey prior to the fall to try to understand what students' experiences with the virus have been and to prepare around their, those experiences. We also um, think that student services should be expanded to focus on reducing isolation among students. We're suggesting that they either um, socially distance or not interact with each other at all in person. So we'll need to focus on isolation. We'll also need to be proactive about addressing mental health, including broad access to counseling services. We also think that uh, student and academic life should be working now on developing co-curricular programming to build uh, networking in a different way that, that is not face-to-face -face networking and also to build resilience. That might look like, for example, creating online study groups, tutoring, support groups, or skill building groups. So one example might be virtual learning living programs, and I'll touch on that in just a minute. But a note here on flexibility. So as the economist on our team pointed out, when your choices are constrained, flexibility becomes extremely attractive. So, um, you know, we would encourage the university to offer as many flexible options as possible in the fall, um, recognizing that flexibility may increase costs. So this cuts through a number of facets. Um, one, like Anna mentioned, we would suggest also that the university offer both in-person and online classes uh, for some of the same classes. And, and the thought here is that we give those options to students and parents and, and hope that that helps to mitigate fear and anxiety about the constrained choices. 
We also might consider, as Anna said, you know, offering faculty flexibility in teaching online if that's preferred. I know in our office we've heard a lot of concerns as well about faculty, um, particularly those over the age of 60 and with chronic conditions who are nervous about coming back to teach on campus in the fall. And then finally, we would similarly suggest that the university allow staff who can successfully work remotely to continue to do so through the fall so as to reduce density on campus. So while we worked through these four scenarios, we would also ask that the university consider providing a menu of options for parents and students. So for example, we might consider creating robust gap year programming um, that might help to engage hesitant first year UK students and might be a selling tool to recruit new students. Our team envisioned this gap year programming as credit bearing experiential courses that could be completed where the students students are. It, helps them, it would help them to dip their toe, so to speak, into the university. You'll see that a lot of the suggestions that we're putting forward operate from a low residency model with only certain groups on campus, and so I'll, I'll share that in a minute. And then finally, just as Anna said, we also agree that there are a lot of elements of these scenarios that can be blended together and or tested concurrently. So moving to the four contingencies. The first was the normal start. So Team Wildcat highly dislikes the use of the word normal and highly discourages the use of the word normal because nothing in the fall will be normal. Instead, the team suggested use of the term reinvented campus. So clearly in any on-case, on-campus scenario, we're going to have to redesign the large lecture courses, move them into smaller sections, maybe 30 students or less, um, increase the use of the flipped classroom. Um, clearly, we're going to have to do a better job of staggering courses so as to reduce population density at any one time. So this would likely require us to extend instructional hours into the evening as well as days of the week into the weekend. Uh, we might consider shorter sessions to complete a course versus you know, the 15 week semester. And I'll show you some of what we discussed with regard to block scheduling. We'll have to redesign classrooms in the scenario, probably remove seats or block or cover certain seats so as to uh, enforce physical distancing. We might think about some classes being taught outside um, when that's possible. We would have to redesign walking routes through campus, much like what you might see in your grocery store, have one-way you know, um, thoroughfares through campus. We also have to think within some of the high volume uh, classroom buildings, maybe designating some of the stairwells up and some are down. One idea that our team wanted to put forward was the concept of cohorting students. So in this scenario, we might think about scaling the LLPs in which we have students functioning within pods or almost like family units who are spending most of their time in the residence halls together with the same students. And in this scenario, we might rotate faculty through these um, residence hall classrooms as opposed to sending the students out to multiple buildings. Um, another example is we might be able to stream classes into these residence hall classrooms. So in this scenario, uh, we would have to redesign housing, um, one or possibly two students per room, re rethink bathrooms. We'd have to redesign Greek housing as well. We'd have to redesign dining. Um, so no more buffets, think more prepackaged items or pre-ordered meals. Um, or if we go with that cohort model, maybe students in those cohorts have designated times in the dining halls, again, to reduce density. Um, we, we think that there should be additional planning um, on lab and studio and performance courses. So um, here again, we would need to think through staggering the times that these groups are meeting, reducing the number of students in those classes, but also we'd have to think through tactics like reducing shared instrumentation, for example. Um, all of these scenarios will require quite a bit of additional disinfecting in between each of those sections. Um, obviously, this, this provides that residential college experience that we know students are, are hoping for in the fall, but we run the risk of additional infections. The second option was the delayed start, and again, we could envision this happening in a number of different ways. Either we all start on a delay in September or October, 
or our team wanted to put forward the notion of a progressive on-campus start. So maybe we start on August 24th with only a certain number of students. Maybe that's first time undergraduate students or some other priority population. And I'll give you some other ideas in a minute. Um, and then perhaps we follow two to four to six or even eight weeks later uh, with, with other groups of students. And this might be combined with a hybrid model. And then there's the block scheduling that we know a lot of other institutions are looking at. Um, lots of different uh, machinations here, three five-week blocks or two eight-week blocks. This would clearly require some adjustments to our academic calendar. So I mentioned one priority on-campus population for an August 24th start might be first-time undergraduate students. But some other groups that we uh, wanted to put out here were student athletes athletes, graduate and professional students, and in particular, you know, we have some concerns about professional students, nursing, medicine, pharmacy, being able to complete their work um, if they're not on campus. Um, also, students who are required to take performance lab and clinical courses, maybe those are the only students that we allow on campus. As Anna mentioned, the block scheduling is gonna pose a lot of challenges. I am concerned about nine month faculty who've left for the semester and won't be back until mid August. This would require significant changes to planning how we deliver coursework. Um, also advising as Anna mentioned and also our registration system, are we equipped to handle this? I have to point out that based on our team's feedback and feedback I've heard from a lot of faculty, I'm hearing that this could represent the worst case scenario that we delay the start and then we start in person and then we shut down. So I've heard this again and again. The third start would be the hybrid start. And again, we can we uh, envision this in a lot of different scenarios. We could um, we could offer all classes online to begin and move in person or vice versa. Or we could offer multiple classes both online and in person. Um, at the same time to reduce density on campus. Some have called this the high flex model. Um, as I mentioned in the spirit of flexibility earlier, we might consider offering um, a menu of online and in-person courses and let parents and students select their preferred delivery. Um, as I just mentioned a minute ago, this could be a useful approach if we're thinking about phasing or gating students, um, student population slowly onto campus for the in-person classes. And our team does like the idea of ending face-to-face -face classes at the Thanksgiving break and requiring all classes uh, to be completed online after that time. As we think through implications and considerations for this model, on the one hand, if faculty are preparing for both in-class and online formats, and I'm hearing this from a lot of department chairs that they're asking faculty to just start planning for this, it is more work for faculty, but on the other hand, this may offer the most most nimble approach um, if we have to switch to all online. Um, if we do this well, this could present an opportunity for the university to be a sustainable model. Um, and clearly the, the um, challenge for the in-person classes would be risk of infection. And for the online classes, um, we do risk student perceptions about quality. So it's interesting that there's this pervasive perception among students that courses that are offered in an online format are somehow of lower quality than those that are offered in person. Those of us that have taught online know that it takes quite a bit more work to deliver it in that format. Um, but, but we've heard about this. And if, this, if the university moves forward with online classes in the fall, we would really encourage uh, communication to get out ahead of it and to emphasize high quality experiences. And then finally, in the hybrid model, we would see a loss of auxiliary revenue. The final scenario, fully online, um, Clearly, the, the top consideration here is that students are going to expect a much higher quality product than what we delivered in the spring. I think there was a lot of grace that was given by students for the quick pivot in an emergency situation, but the expectation is that the courses will be much higher quality. Um, and this will take more work from faculty, so my, my concern about nine-month faculty uh, who are gone stands in this scenario. We would also need additional instructional designers. Perhaps we can bring students, especially graduate students, uh, to help us in, in designing these courses. We would ask the university to consider removing the tuition increase variance between online and in-person courses, in large part because of this pervasive perception on the part of students about a difference in quality. This scenario would clearly pose uh, significant challenges for lack 
lab and studio classes, and there may be accreditation concerns uh, that we would need to consider. If we do this well, then it may position the university well for partnership with Instride or a similar vendor to deliver courses to employees of large companies. And again, we would have to consider student hardware, software, and internet access. And this is my last slide. You know, as we think through this fully online scenario, we also uh, believe that the university would need to invest in additional software and hardware to do this well. There would be a loss of auxiliary revenue, loss of that residential college experience. I mentioned the student perceptions of quality and cost and the potential lack of time to move to this format. And then finally, in this scenario, the virtual LLPs and other students that will need to be delivered virtually um, you know, would really need to be fleshed out in advance of the fall semester.